but you've never failed us, God. We thank you for that today. We thank you for your goodness, that you are always good, that you are kind to us even when we don't deserve it, Lord. We love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I am held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been I've known you as the 
Welcome to Coastline Destin's online service. Glad to be with you this morning. We will be studying Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 34, and we'll be looking at how Jesus has power over the supernatural. Last week I taught how Jesus has power over the natural. This week we have a great guest speaker with us. He's going to be talking about how Jesus has power over the supernatural. Um, before I invite Joel Carter, who is our guest speaker this morning, I want to just share a few things with you. Number one, if you'd like to follow along with Joel this morning, you can go on our Facebook page and click on the link there, and his sermon outline is there for you. Uh, number two, um, I was delighted to hear that President Trump, our dear president, gave an announcement this week that he is encouraging churches to open their doors back up, which I'm really excited for. For us here at Coastline, we're going to stick to uh, the same uh, plan that I shared a week ago to you, that uh, June 7th, we feel that that is a good Sunday to open our doors here at Coastline. So uh, put that on your calendar. We're going to be opening the doors here at Coastline Destin uh, to resume our services on Sunday mornings. And our time is going to be the same, 930, our first Sunday, though, at June 7th. We're not going to have kids' ministry we're going to have a family-style service. We're going to have everybody to come and just worship together. So we'll give you more details on that next week. Um, so the third thing I want to share is if you're free next Friday, May 29th, we want to invite you to come on out to fellowship at Henderson State Beach. Bring your dinner, bring your beach gear, bring a friend, and enjoy some fellowship uh, with the body of Christ. We'll be planning on meeting there at 5 p.m. and we'll hang all the way till dark, till 8 o'clock. So we'd love for you to come on out and uh, see you face to face. And then lastly, um, we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend. We know Monday is coming and I just want to take a moment to remember and acknowledge all the men and women who have lost their lives serving this amazing country that you and I get to live in. And I also want to give thanks to those that are serving in the military now today and just tell you how much we appreciate you. We thank you for your service and your sacrifice. So I'm going to have Pastor Roger come on up right now and lead us in a word of prayer. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes, and join us for a word of prayer. All right. Father God, we come to you today, Lord, and we just thank you for this day. Father, we thank you that this is a country where we can still acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of so many men and women that have gone before us, uh, those that are currently serving, Lord, and those that will serve. We just pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would bless their families, Lord, that you would go ahead of them as you do and just provide a hedge of protection around them. Father, we thank you that... Uh, we can find uh, freedom here in the United States, but we thank you, Lord, that we can also find freedom in you. We thank you, Lord, that on this Memorial Day that there is no grave to go to uh, to find your son, Jesus. There's no grave to decorate because the tomb was empty, Lord. 
and we thank you for that. And Lord, because of that, we know that death is not the end for us. Those who know you as Lord and Savior, those who have accepted you into their hearts, Lord, we know that you have promised us a place. And so, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have. We thank you for the freedom that we can find in you. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, be with all of those men and women today. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful and powerful name and all God's children say. Hey, Coastline. Uh, we're excited to have you today. We've been walking through Matthew 8, and we find ourselves at the end of the chapter here. Uh, we've watched uh, God have power over uh, storms, over uh, healing diseases, and, and we're going to see how uh, right now God has power over the supernatural and the demonic. Um, it's a weird area, and so we're going to uh, take it uh, fast, and we're going to go through a lot, but I, I know that uh, from when we used to meet together, I trust you guys to handle the deep content of the Bible. So we're going to come up against some of the edges of what the Bible does and doesn't say about that, and we're going to, uh, I think, hopefully debunk some of the, the weird parts of, of that, uh, and what we'll be left with is an adequate uh, representation of what the Bible does say about the demonic. And we want to do this because it's not going to go away. This is one of the first times we encounter it, but we're going to see it over and over again in the ministry of Jesus' life. And so if you'll join me in prayer real quick, we're going we're to try and get you ahead of your own time. God, we are so thankful that we can trust you, that your word is the light and the guide to live by. Would you give us more of your Holy Spirit to understand it today? Give us wisdom to, to not go beyond what you say but to live comfortably within the bounds of what your, your word allows. Give us more of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for knowing us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Starting in verse 28, I'm going to read through it. And I want to go line by line because there's so many truths that we get from this passage. Um, and I, and I, I want to make sure that we ruminate on that correctly. So uh, I'll read it once and then we'll, we'll go through it and pick out the pieces. Verse 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off and went to the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. If you're following along, you can write down three words. That was weird. And if that wasn't weird to you, I think that you're weird, right? Because what we saw was Jesus first rebuked the wind and the waves and then got out of a boat, saw some demon-possessed men who live in the graves, got up, talked to demons inside of them, commanded them out into pigs, and the pigs ran down a large cliff, killing all themselves and committing mass swineside. That is not a normal day. That's not one of those days where you're at home and your wife says, what happened at work? And you're like, hmm. Well, I don't think anything interesting. No, this is a red letter day. Um, and, and the parts of Christianity that we come up against and are confronted with in the demonic are, are the weird parts, the not adequately defined parts, the supernatural. And there's the tendency in us to walk away from the parts that don't make immediate sense, that, that challenge us and make us uncomfortable. And when we do that, we've invented and picked a part and made a religion of, of our own doing. And, and we're not going to do that. So I want to walk through this with you today and give you an adequate framework for dealing with the demonic. Let's go back to verse 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming from the tombs. See, we're dropped into the scene. There's no explanation or footnotes in my Bible or yours that says, oh, by the way, demons are incorporeal spirits that influence and, and hinder the lives of believers trying to know Christ. No, it just assumes the existence. And in fact, the framework that the Bible gives us for dealing with the demonic, the demonic doesn't really provide an adequate origin. Um, we, we see uh, a couple of the key players throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, we see the serpent or Satan represented in the Garden of Eden. We see the demonic influence over King David and, and King Saul uh, and, and other kings throughout the Old Testament. But it, it never once tries to explain the origin of this. It just assumes. 
And even the best systematic theology tech books will tell you that we're, we're really left somewhat wanting on, on where this all comes from. I want to read a passage in Revelation 12. It helps elucidate a little bit some of the, I think, the best opinions surrounding this. Um, but it, it certainly, again, leaves us with the, the words that every Christian should be comfortable saying, I don't know. Starting in Revelation 12, verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. In verse 8, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. This great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. We see, we see a, a supernatural battle between the angelic, the, the side of good, the, the God, and, and what's correlated with the serpent, the Satan, devil, the demonic. We see, we see Satan and his angels. And that, that term is extremely important. We, we don't get an adequate creation story of the demonic, but one of the best explanations we have is that the demons are... The, uh, the angels that chose to ally themselves with Satan. Um, there's, there's several other theories, and I, and I don't want to dig in that because we don't have a lot of time. Sometimes if you can think of one reason, it's enough to, to kind of put your, your mind at rest. And, and again, the Bible, we're not going to go beyond what it says, um, but we see that term over and over again. And, and, and the fallen angels has some nice properties in that it, it, God, who continually creates good things, uh, creates angels that fall away just like we've seen Satan. Um, and so the general consensus that we get is that the demonic is, is of the origin of fallen angels. Again in verse 28, they were so violent, the demon-possessed men, that no one could pass that way. Again, and it's moderately uncomfortable, the Bible leaves us with not adequately explaining the mechanism or the role of the demonic in our lives. It, it tells us the impact and leaves us to gauge uh, what we're left with. Um, but I think a great analogy for our lives as believers is the work of the Holy Spirit. See, what the Bible does do is explain in great degree that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God given to the believer as a promised deposit for salvation. Paul goes further with churches in the New Testament and says, continue to desire more and more to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he reminds them, don't quench the Spirit. So we see... Uh, the, the ability of a spirit, a, 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 an incorporeal body, to work within the life of a believer to affect, uh, change the outcome, actions, and intentions of that person. And we see that it can happen in a varying degree. And that's extremely important when we're trying to look at an analogy with the demonic because in the same way that the Holy Spirit can act in the life of a believer, uh, allowing and, and, and changing and, and refining, we see in, in these men... Uh, various effects of the demonic. Um, and, and, and so we've seen everything from demonic influence represented in the Bible all the way up to what we hear here, which is demonic possession, as marked by uh, increased anger, strength. It says they were so strong that no one could go that way. In parallel passages, it says that those men slept in the grave and, and, and wore tattered or no clothes at all. Excellent. You guys have made it through the hard part. Thanks for following along so far. Um, we're, we're almost done, and this is where we, we've, we've got more and more clarity and where God's Word really chimes in with the things that you and I as believers really need to know. They stand and they see Jesus and they say, What do you want with us, Son of God? Verse 29. That's extremely important because the tendency in our world today is to explain away the supernatural, the things that don't make sense in, a, in our scientific easily understandable world as uh, just uh, ancient people dealing with uh, the inability to understand medicine, mental disorder, uh, health, disease, right? Um, we, we can look back and say, oh, those were simpler times and, and they believed in spirits and demons and, and we've graduated past that. And to be honest, uh, I think it's a very elegant interpretation. Some other interpretations are that this is just a representation of the chaos and, the, and the, the hardship of the world. And those do a great disservice to Christianity. And this passage forces us to stare at the raw truth. And it's this. I don't 
know any disease, mental illness, or ailment that can stare at the Son of God before he's revealed himself to his own disciples and say, what do you want with us, Son of God? See, we're out of the realm of medical explanation. We're out of the realm of superstition. And we're in the realm of having to pick apart the Bible and choose the pieces that we don't want if we don't accept the literal interpretation of the demonic in this passage. And that's helpful because there are other passages where we could have an easy out. And so I want you guys to have the framework to deal with that, to understand that, yes, there is the supernatural, and it does have an effect on ourselves today. This is super important, too. They say, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? They speak of the end game. And like we saw with the Bible, it doesn't give us an origin. It gives us modern information surrounding the middle. And it's so clear about the end game for evil uh, and, and, and for the believer. And so let's look at that real quick in Matthew 25. We're going to see that Jesus says, starting in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. Verse 33 he says, He'll put the sheep on his left, on his right, and the goats on his left. Hopping down to verse 41, and this is important. And then he will say to those on his left, the, the, the goats, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, there's that term again that we heard in Revelations, the devil and his angels. See, again, I don't know any mental disorder, physical incapacity that, that can call the Son of God out before he's revealed himself to his own disciples and adequately predict the future before Jesus himself has even done so, before John the Revelator had even had a vision surrounding what's coming. See, we're forced to deal with the ugly truth that, that this is real, this is happening. And, and as Christians, we can't, we can't censor it, we can't isolate it. See, when, when my wife married me, she knew she was marrying a nerdy white guy. Uh, and, and that's fine. She agreed with that. Ten years later, when I start walking out of the house in Crocs and a fanny pack, she has to confront the truth that she is committed to staying with that. And the beauty of that is, is uh, that it's actually strengthened our relationship. I don't have to wear my wedding ring anymore because people know that I'm off the market with Crocs and a fanny pack. Um, and, and we can learn so much about the Word of God by confronting it for what it is, instead of trying to transform it into what we want. Matthew 8, going on to verse 29, he says, Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? You see, the, the mark of the demonic is this, and we, and we read it in this passage. What we know of God in the Bible is that God is a loving God, right? The Bible says that God is love, right? Um, but what we see in the mark of the demonic is that they distort the truth of God and they believe the worst of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever tell us that God is going to torture someone. It does speak of a time of eternal separation because the people that God knows, the people that he loves, are too important to let the evil and the chaos in his own home. But nowhere does it tell us. But what we do see is a false accusation. Jesus, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? We can chase that mark throughout the Bible. In fact, and all the way in the beginning when we see Eve in the Garden of Eden with the serpent, who we learned is representative of Satan, he says, did God really say you can't eat from any fruit in the garden? And Eve says, no, actually he made this whole thing for us to eat. See, Satan is distorting the truth. And, and she says, we just can't eat from that one tree. Otherwise, we'll die. And here goes Satan again. He says, did God really say you would die? No, he knows that if you eat it, you'll be like him. You see the distortion? It went from protection to prevention of blessing. And that's what we see at the mark of the demonic. And what's so encouraging, friends, is that the mark of our God, the Holy Spirit, is called, referred to as the spirit of truth. In fact, when, when, when Jesus stood up in, 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 in the crowds and said, if anyone would come to me, he must eat my flesh and drink my blood. What we see is a mass exodus. People saying, that is creepy. But then he turns to his disciples and he says, aren't you going to go too? And the response is this, Lord, where else can we go? Because only you 
have the words of truth. See, even in the weirdness, in the, in the rough edges, in the warts that we don't want in life, what we see is the example of believing the best about God, understanding his fidelity. You guys are doing great. We're almost done. 831, Matthew 831, here's what we see. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Careful we don't miss this. What we see is a legion of demons asking God for permission. That is so important because I don't care where they came from. I don't care what they can do now. I know where they're going and I know who they're obedient to. And that is where I can find my comfort. Paul tells us uh, to the Ephesian church in chapter 6 of Ephesians, starting at verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, in the church, we have, I think, two failure modes. One is that I believe that the demonic doesn't exist. It's archaic. It's outmoded. The other is that I believe that it influences everything, that it controls, and it, and it takes too much precedence. And, and we've let Hollywood and Stephen King define the narrative for us. But what we see here is Paul redefining and saying, you could focus on the legion of things that can go wrong, or you could stare at the one person who makes you right with God. You could stare at the evil, and you could spend your life running from sin and death, but you're going to fight a battle on every side. Why not just fight the singular battle of getting to know Christ and becoming like him? And that's the rest that we find in this passage, in the power of Christ. Whatever you fear, friends, turns out it's what you end up worshiping. And what I mean by that is whatever you dwell on occupies a place in your thoughts and your mind and your heart that's reserved only for Christ. Continuing in verse 32, Jesus said to them, go. That's it. We have some parallel passages in Mark and Luke where there's a little bit more dialogue, but I love how Matthew lays this text out, and it's so important because through all this, we only have one word from Jesus. Go. And with that, the whole town goes into shambles. He drives out demons. He upends an entire town with the word go. What I want you to see here is the power of a single word from God. See, we've walked through chapter 8, and Roger did a great job showing us that God has power over death with his words in, in the story of the centurion. Jess did an awesome job walking us through uh, last week when Jesus stood up and rebuked the wind and the waves. He has power over disaster with his words. And today we learn that he has power over the demonic, the supernatural with his words. And in fact, that's the God that we've known since the beginning of time. The Bible opens with, and God said, and there was. That's so important. Jess reminded us last week that when I say something, I'm just putting some hope and wish out into the ether. But when God says something, it materializes. It is. Um, if, I, if I go in my house and I say, we only eat food in the kitchen, I can promise you my kids are going to stomp on Cheerios in the living room and smear yogurt on my couch. I don't have the ability to affect change with what I say. But what we see in God is the exact opposite. In fact, God's words appear to be tantamount with action. John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He's telling us about Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, by Him and through whom all things were created. Isaiah does a great job of explaining to us. He says in chapter 55, starting at verse 10, he likens God's Word. God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, says that my Word is like rain. It goes out, it waters the crops, and it doesn't return back to me without fulfilling its purpose. Friends, we don't have time to go deep. I know you guys are armchair theologians. The word we want to look up is speech, act, theory. God's speech is equivalent to action in his life. And that's one of the defining characteristics of God. Let there be, and it was, go. And then it happened. The entire universe is waiting on permission from God. And if you're looking for security, it's there. And if you're wondering why we as a church put such an emphasis on prayer, it's that 
because I promise you that you're going to find more clarity in your life from five minutes on a couch asking the creator, author, and finisher of your faith what to do than ten years of working on the corporate ladder, than, than, than two years of, of, of trying in your own strength. And that is the beauty of the word of God. Friends, we're going to close with this. Thank you for following along. Matthew 8, verse 34. Then the whole town went out, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. See, Jesus isn't someone that you can have mixed opinions about. You either love him or you leave him alone. You either ask him, go away or be our king. See, over and over throughout the scripture, we see Jesus entering a town, and they either want to put him up on their shoulders and make him their leader, or they drive him up to the edge of a cliff and want to throw him off. Jesus is divisive, and not in a mean way, in a way that forces you to stare at the truth and decide, do you want to be on that side or the opposite? You see, this whole town had the choice between restoring lives of two demon-possessed men or a bunch of pigs. They prized eating well over a whole human. Jesus tells us earlier in Matthew that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And here's the challenge for us today, friends. We've watched that God has the power to restore and to destroy. Where in our lives are we becoming more comfortable with lies than staring head on at the awkward truths? Where do I look at God working in my life and choose instead of believing the best about him to doubt, to be a fair weather friend? Where am I working towards the things in my life that don't matter And where am I succeeding at the things that don't? Friends, would you allow God to come into your lives? And we're going to pray that right now. And destroy. To run things off cliffs in your lives that don't belong there. And to raise things up that you thought were dead. Because that's the God that we serve today. We're going to go to him in prayer. And after this, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out on our Facebook, on our email, any mechanism you have. Our goal here is to help remove every obstacle between you and the creator that so deeply desires to know you. Father, we're so excited that that we're allowed to talk to you, uh, that, that, that while the whole earth bows at your feet and waits for a word from you, that you stand excited to hear from us as your children. Would you send your Holy Spirit to convict, to show us where we've become complacent, where we've cut out parts of your truth that need to be operative in our life, where we need to run things off cliffs, where relationships that need to be ended or or habits or um, just thought patterns, God, point out the lies through your spirit of truth and help us come into the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you, Father.